Wow. Thank you for being so respectful to Dinesh since uh, you're, uh, he's up on our turf here now. Uh, last two of our debates, this is the rubber match, the best two out of three here. Uh, he won one, I won the other one, so today's the tiebreaker. And uh, I was largely on her, his turf before and, and everybody uh, treated me with respect. So, uh, and thank you, uh, Harvey Papel, the host of Athens in Jerusalem for uh, co-hosting today. And uh, of course, for Tom for normally doing my job and for, uh, to Bill for uh, moderating. So just, uh, just to see how much the turf is uh, slanted one way or the other, how many of you would consider yourselves to be believers in, in a God of any kind, any personal sort of God? Okay, it's still a sizable, wow, still a sizable majority, I would say. I understand where you're coming from. I was a, a born-again evangelical Christian. I matriculated at uh, Pepperdine University to major in theology, and, and uh, we did the evangelical door-to-door -door thing, which we called uh, Amway with Bibles. You know, you're out there uh, pitching, and uh, and then and then I went through my in, in my twenties my uh, switch around and became sort of a born again atheist and went around knocking at those same doors and said you know, I was was wrong about that other thing I was telling you, <laughs> which sort of reminds me of what you get when you cross a Jehovah Witness with an atheist and that's somebody who knocks on your door for no reason at all. <laughs> And then I saw a bumper sticker that I think uh, maybe captures where I'm at now. It said, the militant agnostic, I don't know and you don't either. <laughs> uh, a theist knows there's a God, an atheist, or at least the strong version of an atheist knows there is no God. Uh, as Woody Allen said, to you I'm an atheist, to God I'm the loyal opposition. Uh, it depends what we mean by these terms. And agnostic was originally coined in 1869 by Thomas Huxley to mean simply that it's unknowable in any scientific uh, rational sense. And, uh, uh, and, I, and I suppose in that sense, as a statement of the universe, well, nobody knows, militant agnostic. Uh, agnostic seems to be a right word about what we know about the universe. And uh, the problem with that word, of course, is it's, it's loaded like all words are. Stephen Colbert said an agnostic is just an atheist without balls. And uh, <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm not crazy about that word either. And um, <laughs> And so a non-theist seems like a fairly neutral uh, word. I guess I'm, I'm, I'm just going on about this because of the so-called new atheism and that word keeps coming up. And uh, uh, I suppose, uh, like Woody Allen, uh, I, I would convert if, if only God would give me some clear sign, like making a large deposit in my name in a Swiss bank <laughs> would do it. Um, and of course, that gets us to the question of um, uh, sort of the empirical nature of some of these claims. Although we're not debating God's existence here, uh, on, a, on a deep level, it does matter because it isn't likely that anyone would argue for Christianity being good for the world or any other religion if they didn't also believe it was actually true. Not, not just psychologically true or true for me, but actually true. And that's when uh, we get into that fuzzy area between, well, how do we know what's true? And, and that's where uh, you get some blending between science uh, and religion. And to that extent, atheism really isn't a thing, neither is secularism. You see the, the conservative talk show hosts, they're all, always talking about they want to, the atheists want to convert America to a secular nation, like, like a secular thing is a thing. It's, it, it's simply a word that means without religion. And uh, America is a secular government in that sense. There's no religious test for who, who's a citizen or not, at least there shouldn't be. And, uh, and that's, that's where it gets kind of heated and political. So to that extent, I'm not making a case for secularism or atheism because it's just the default position you begin at and then build on from there with something else. And I'm not even arguing for science as a belief system because it isn't. It's, a, it's just a tool for understanding the way the world works. If you want to get a spacecraft to Mars, you're better off using uh, astronomy rather than astrology, say, something like that. It, it works, and that's why we use it. Um, and, uh, and so to that extent, science depends on natural explanations for phenomenon. And when we talk about God and miracles and the intervention and, and say, uh, giving us moral laws and so forth, uh, at some point then, then the deity steps into our universe and stirs up the particle. Somehow he intervenes. And and uh, also, although I make a joke about the large deposit in the Swiss bank, although that would, that would be interesting, uh, uh, people do pray in the hopes of, of an intervention. And they pray for, often typically pray for things that might have changed anyway. And that's why you see prayers for cancer, but you never hear or see prayers or at least hear about them uh, for, say, growing a new limb. Uh, why is that? Why, I mean, here we have all these 
uh, soldiers who have bravely fought for our freedom in Iraq coming back missing limbs, why does nobody pray for them to grow a new limb? Why can't God grow a new limb? A salamander can do it. Surely the creator of the universe could do it. And that's the problem where we get in, in trying to, to sort of determine an, an empirical basis for some of these claims. Um, and, and the problem for a scientist for describing any of these things would be, how would you know that it was a supernatural uh, intervention? How would you distinguish between a natural and a supernatural? So if we step back for a moment and say something slightly more neutral, like, um, is ESP real? Can people read each other's thoughts? And there's a theory about this that the way it, they, they assume that it's true, this is Roger Penrose and Stuart Hameroff's theory, that inside neurons are these little microtubules that hold the neurons together. Inside the, these tubules are these little vacuums in which you can get a quantum state and the atoms all collapse the wave function in a particular pattern and that's how thoughts get traversed across the distance uh, from my skull to your skull, Some, something like that. That's their theory. Now let's just say for a moment it turns out it's true. People can read each other's minds and that's the explanation. Well, that's no longer now a paranormal phenomenon. That's just now neurophysics. And this is the fate of all these kinds of supernatural paranormal claims. They either get absorbed into a natural scientific explanation or they just go away because there's no basis for the claim. So once you start pushing into some of these realms, this is what we're experiencing with science and religion, uh, we end up in these gaps where you scientists have yet to explain X, and that's where we think the supernatural divine uh, intervention came in. That may be, but what are you going to do, what are you going to claim when we do have an explanation for that? When, or the explanation simply, or the claim simply goes away with lack of evidence. So uh, what we're faced with basically are two, two things uh, uh, what we'll end up debating today. I know because this is our third time and it always comes up. And that, and that uh, basically the two big last gaps, the, the origins of the moral sentiments, where, where our morality came from, and how do you explain the whole universe and the fine-tunedness. As Kant said, the starry heavens above and the moral law within. So well, we have explanations for these, but they're not fully accepted by science yet, and that's where we end up uh, having the great debates. So, now, on to the specific question, the first one, is Christianity a force for good or evil? Well, it, uh, it depends. Obviously, the answer is yes. <laughs> uh, it reminds me of my libertarian uh, friends having these debates, is government good or evil? <laughs> well, which part? <laughs> and who? And what are they doing? And so on. And uh, My answer, in short, I guess... Uh, I would quote Winston Churchill's assessment of Americans. Uh, you can always count on Americans to do the right thing after they've tried everything else. <laughs> and uh, in my opinion of religion, you can always count on religion to do the right thing after they've tried everything else in that sense. And, and so although uh, it's an interesting debate, uh, on the one hand, if you live in a secular government where there is no uh, religious tests for citizenship, and you have constitutions and bills of rights and protections of freedom, it really doesn't matter what somebody's uh, religion is or what their beliefs are, as long as you have the freedom to think and disbelieve as you will. Uh, and the problem, though, of course, what we face is that uh, too many religious people in the world today uh, are not satisfied with that the world is big enough for all of us to be uh, share in our different beliefs. Uh, to the religious mind, at least the absolutist, or fundamentalist uh, religious mind where uh, there is an absolute truth and we have it and you must, you must be converted to that. Uh, until every knee is bowed in submission, uh, that's where uh, we get into trouble uh, with uh, a religious extremism. Now when we say, is Christianity good? Because we're not just talking about religion. I would even say, well, which one? According to the uh, Oxford World Christian Encyclopedia, there's no less than 33,000 different Christian sects. Uh, worldwide. So, so which one of those is the one that's good and which one of them is not so good? Um, I mean, Protestant Christians determined to murder Catholic Christians over turf and politics in Northern Ireland? That's not good. Or Mormon Christians who belong to the Fundamentalist Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, who believe that it's acceptable to force 13-year-old girls to have sex with men five times their age? That's not good. Or Pentecostal Christians who indoctrinate young children into becoming warriors for Christ through Jesus camps. Uh, that's not good. Evangelical Christians who believe so strongly in the sanctity of life that they blow up abortion clinics and kill doctors. That's not good. Or Catholic Christians whose priestly pedophile program of, in the words of Christopher Hitchens, no child's behind left. <laughs> Also not good. <laughs> uh, 
So the problem, of course, is um, anecdotally, any of us can tally up on the side of good or, or evil what, what side we're already on. We are, by nature, a tribal uh, and xenophobic. Uh, and uh, so naturally, any member of any group is going to remember, based on the confirmation bias where we look for and find confirmatory evidence for what we already believe and just ignore all the rest, we naturally can just remember all the good things our, our club did and the bad things the other group did. And uh, so the question is, historically and scientifically, can we answer the question, is, is, uh, is Christianity good or evil, and, and can we be good without God? Well, on the issue of slavery, I want to say something about that. I, I do think, uh, uh, upon Dinesh's recommendation, uh, I rented uh, Amazing Grace, the film about William Wilberforce uh, and his drive to abolish slavery through illegal channels in, in England. And, and it's a terrific film, but what stood out for me was not the her heroism of Christianity to, to, blight, to, to end this blight on, on civilization, but that he stood out as so unusual amongst all his fellow Christians who uh, would not go along with it for decades because they had, because they had financial interest in it, basically. Um, but you can certainly picture how easy it would be to justify even something as, uh, as extreme as slavery with uh, biblical passages. For example, Colossians 4.22, slaves. You just picture yourself back in time. You're in a, you're in a church, a Christian church in England, listening to the justification of slavery. Because in Colossians it says, slaves, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing the Lord. Or 1 Peter 2.18, servants, be submissive to your masters with all respect, not only to the kind and gentle, but also the overbearing. Um, so it's easy to pick and choose passages from the Bible that support what you currently believe, what the culture currently accepts as, as the morally right thing to do. But then what happens is there's a shift in culture for a whole variety of reasons, part of which is religion, but part of which I think has to do with, with other things in which oppressed peoples just get tired of being oppressed and they stand up and fight back. Then some religious people may be on, on that side, and if they win, we call attention to them and make movies about them. But what about all the Christians at the time who opposed that? Now, slavery is it's sort of a, it's an old issue, but let's take a current one, and that is gay marriage and homosexuality as a case study. Um, now, it appears that um, a, a small percentage of the population, maybe one to three percent, I, I doubt if it's much more than that, are born uh, preferring uh, uh, members of the same sex rather than the opposite sex. Uh, for whatever reason, it appears to have something to do with genetics and prenatal biochemistry and hormone balance and so forth. Um, asking a homosexual whether he or she chose to become gay is like asking a heterosexual, when did you choose to become straight? To which she'd be like, what, uh, what are you talking about? I've always felt that way. And that is precisely, in fact, what gay people tell you when you ask them that. Nevertheless, on this particular issue, I think it's a, an example of Christianity still mired in pre-civil rights, pre-enlightenment, and even pre-scientific medieval thinking, basing their beliefs on a few biblical passages such as Leviticus 18, thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind, it is an abomination. Until you look at the passages on the either side in, in Leviticus, uh, in which uh, we are instructed, parents are instructed to kill their disobedient children and to execute adulterous wives and non-virgin brides. <clears throat> That's right, the death penalty for adultery, which would immediately eliminate a good number of Christian congressmen and senators, preachers and televangelists. <laughs> and as a consequence of this embarrassing lapse of Christian charity and Jesus' doctrine of love for all humanity, Christian preachers, writers, theologians think nothing of tormenting gays by telling them that their desire to love another person of the same sex is an abomination, and by telling them uh, that uh, promiscuity is evil, but that the single best prophylactic against it, marriage, is legally banned from them, and then expect them to act accordingly. Christians actually believe they're being charitable when they say, well, we hate the sin, but not the sinner, something like that. Joel Osteen was on CNN a couple of weeks ago, in which um, uh, the, uh, the host, it wasn't Anderson Cooper, it was his fill-in, uh, was interviewing him about, he's controversial because he's the, go he's the uh, wealth gospel, the gospel of wealth uh, preacher, and, and Rick Warren, he of purpose-driven life, who gives away most of his money, was critical of Ols Osteen's emphasis on money. 
And anyway, so then they got into uh, whether gays should be allowed into the church. And here Osteen made a big point about how ecumenical and liberal and open-minded he was by letting, in, in fact, encouraging gays to come to his congregation because we should open our arms to all sick and diseased people who need help. Well, I don't know if I'm going to bend down on a knee or not today. We'll see on that. Uh, well, anyway, thanks, thanks so much uh, for having me here. It's great. Uh, uh, flew into Nashville yesterday and drove up the interstate, and uh, I noticed on the right side there coming up into, uh, into the area here, there was a huge, it was probably either Presbyterian or Baptist, I couldn't quite tell right there, and I thought, oh my gosh, the people of Tennessee do not apparently believe in the separation of church and interstate. Anyway, so... Uh, <laughs> Now that the writer's strike is over, this is the only place I can use my material. <laughs> anyway, uh, so I was once a uh, born-again Christian. I went to Pepperdine University um, in Malibu there and uh, uh, to study theology, and um, I, I did what, what, what we called witnessing, uh, uh, that is, Amway with Bibles. We would go around and, and uh, tell people about uh, Jesus and God and so forth. So um, uh, I, took this, I took this fairly seriously, and... And then later I became something of a born-again atheist, I suppose, and went around to those same houses and, you know, knocked on the doors and said, you know, I take it back. <laughs> and, uh, really. And uh, uh, I don't like the labels too much. I suppose um, a bumper sticker I saw once when I was in uh, Dayton, Tennessee, to visit the uh, uh, place of the Scopes Monkey Trial, uh, said, militant agnostic, I don't know, and you don't either. And uh, maybe something like that represents it. I don't know, the whole thing sort of reminds me of uh, what you get when you cross a Jehovah Witness with an atheist, and that's somebody who knocks on your door for no reason at all. <laughs> and uh, the labels are problematic. I think um, uh, the answer to the question, is religion a force for good or evil, is right. yes. <laughs> I mean, it depends. Uh, I think one of the things I liked about, uh, you, you met Harvey Papel and his publishing this book, Bondage of the Mind. I think the strong point there is not that religion is the problem, it's fundamentalism, by which he means, and by which I would mean, extremism of any kind uh, is the problem, especially if you have the power to do something about it to enforce your will on other people politically uh, through violence. That's the problem. Um, and so to the extent that religion does good, it's good. When religion does bad, it's bad. Uh, it just depends on the context and who's doing what to whom. And uh, so to that extent, I don't really care what somebody believes as long as they uh, employ the principle of freedom and liberty. That is, uh, I should have the freedom to believe or disbelieve what I want, and so should you, as long as we don't interfere with each other's freedoms. And unfortunately, there are others in the world who don't honor the principle of liberty and freedom, as the president was talking about this morning. And and uh, the only thing I suppose I disagree with him there, by the way, I'm, I'm a conservative atheist. I think there's only two of us, me and Christopher Hitchens. <laughs> and uh, uh, I, 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 the only thing I would disagree there, the, the idea, it's something of a platitude, I suppose, liberty is, is a, a God-given right. It sure doesn't look like it. it. Historically, you pretty much just have to fight for it, and it can be taken away at any moment. And so eternal vigilance is the, is the cost of freedom. Um, anyway, so uh, and I wanted to make a few comments about um, the rise of the so-called new atheism or the militant atheism. These guys, Chris Hitchens and Richard Dawkins and so forth, Sam Harris, are good friends of mine. And, uh, and, and I know from, from where they're coming, because I'm there too, and, and, and we travel in the same circles, and uh, if you go to an ACLU meeting, they'll show a film just like the one you saw here from the ADF. This is pretty much the same thing, you know, uh, on every front we're besieged by attacks on freedom and so forth, and we have to gather the troops and raise some money, and all, all groups do that wave the red meat in, in, uh, in, in an alarmist way in order to gather the support of their members. And, uh, and unfortunately, we are tribal by nature. We evolved in these small groups in which, uh, within our groups, we're fairly moral, pro-social, altruistic, cooperative, nice. Between groups, we can be fairly nasty, tribal, xenophobic. Um, and unfortunately, I think you see some of that going on here. Post 9-11 and the rise of the evangelical right into uh, modern politics, I think, has tilted the pendulum off to another way that makes those of us who don't believe feel a little besieged. A little, a, a, it's a little too much in your face, uh, if, if I can be blunt. Um, that's what makes people like Chris Hitchens and, and Sam Harris and Richard Dawkins, myself, others, write the things we write. It's like, enough already. We know what you believe. Uh, just leave us alone. And uh, 
and, and unfortunately, that, that, isn't, that, that isn't always the case. The latest stats on this, by the way, uh, there's about 10% of us that have no belief in God at all in America, and another 10% who are what the sociologists call unchurched, that is, they don't belong to any faith or church. They have uh, no commitment to any religion at all. Um, that's 20%. That's 60 million Americans. So when somebody like Mitt Romney gives his famous religion speech and he says, if I'm president, I'll represent people of all faiths, 60 million Americans are listening to this going, um, excuse me, you just left out, you know, 60 million people. Uh, so I guess I would only ask those of you in the religious broadcasting community, don't forget there's a lot of us out there. This would account for why Dawkins' book, for example, sold 1.3 million in hardback. Um, there's a market for those of us who feel a little besieged. Uh, and whether we're really besieged or not, well, you know, we live in America. We're all pretty well uh, gifted with, with freedom and protection and so on compared to other parts of the world. I think it is that natural tribalism we have to watch out for. And if that was any, the, the only message I had today, it would be, it would be that, that if any time there's a, if any time in history where we really need to watch out for those, those natural xenophobic tribalisms, including between us non-believers and you believers, this, this would be a good time to find some common ground. Well, obviously, lots of people who have, well, I just said, 60 million Americans have no, uh, well, okay, say half that are, are atheists or agnostics, 30 million have no belief in God. And there's no data, statistically, um, from the people that study sociology of religion, um, uh, morally, between believers and non-believers. There's no measure anyone's ever had that non-believers get divorced more often or have more affairs or lie more, or cheat more in business or anything like that. Not a shred of evidence for that. And you can go to George Barna, who is an evangelical Christian pollster who studies these things. So I'm not picking out the ACLU data. I'm picking out the evangelical data uh, in which that, that is the case. So uh, in practice, no, there's no difference. And, um, and uh, in principle, why should there be uh, any difference? Because I agree with you that there is in our human nature, the capacity for great moral sentiments. That is, we have moral emotions. We feel guilt when we violate social relationships. Uh, we feel pride and joy when we help people in an altruistic, pro-social way. We have these capacities. I happen to think that they evolved because we're a social species that has to have these capacities. I mentioned earlier how tribal we are. Those moral capacities mostly exist within groups, between groups. As we all know, as we can see, uh, we're very xenophobic and tribal. And uh, so there, in that sense, in, in sort of a group competitiveness, uh, that's the dark side uh, of our human nature. So, and you already agree with this. You just put different labels on it. The labels don't matter. You can say good or evil or original sin. Uh, my only problem with original sin at this point is I can't think of any. <laughs> They've all been taken. Anyway. It's about a boob. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll give up the, uh, the ghost writing thing. Um, and so, just like nobody today would make the argument that we need God to explain the workings of the solar system. We have a perfectly good uh, grounded theory on physics and cosmology and the condensing cloud of interstellar gas that forms solar systems. Nobody says, you know, God did it. We all know how it happened naturally. And believers just say, well, that's how God set up the universe to operate this way, and we're all on, on the same page there. There's no conflict. Why not just say that same argument? Evolution is simply the way God created the amazing and wonderful diversity of life. Instead of seeing science as a conflict, uh, a challenge, a threat to your faith, just see it as a way of illuminating God's creation. And this is the way God did it. So I would argue the moral sentiments, the, the Dinesh and I believe many of the, most of the same things. We're both conservative. And so I think those came about through evolution. If, if that's the way God did it, that's fine with me. I have no conflict there. Well, I, I think um, it, we have to separate the question out from uh, uh, metaphorically versus really. That is, is there really actually a heaven? Is there really some place or hell that you go to, that something after your body is ceased and your brain is decayed that continues on into the ether somewhere? Uh, at the moment, we have no evidence for this. This is truly an article of faith. This is, uh, really puts the leap into Kierkegaard's leap of faith here. Uh, because what would be the transmission medium? How would you transmit the neural impulses that form your memories into something else that stores those memories, that keeps you going in some other place that we might metaphorically or really call heaven and hell? 
Um, I think a better way to think about it is uh, metaphorically, that, um, that we have a sense of transcendency and spirituality within us, that is something that takes us outside of ourselves, that's bigger than ourselves. Uh, the evidence is fairly overwhelming now that uh, people that are spiritual, however you define that, and I don't think religion has a monopoly on spirituality. There's lots of ways to be spiritual. Uh, life is hard enough as it is. But let's not just claim that there's only one way to get through it. Um, and I think there's a lot of ways to do it. For me, it's not through the traditional sources of religion, but I do feel as a, as a spiritual person, there are ways to get out of myself by helping others. Um, and uh, so I can tie that in with a previous question that is, uh, for example, I did an adopt a child through uh, World Vision um, and, uh, and when you do that, you go on the web page and they have a little picture of the, of the, of the child and a little factoids about it. What, what's going on there from a scientific point of view is they're tapping into my natural propensity to want to help somebody who's close to me, who I know, who I can see, who matters. Why should we be nice to people that are 9,000 miles away? It's true. It's almost impossible to get people to care about that unless you bring it home with an actual photograph. And what they're doing there is tapping into that. That's a way of being transcendent. That is stepping outside of yourself to help somebody else. I don't see what in, in, invoking God as an explanation for that adds anything to the question. Because why, wh what's the source, uh, what, what's God's source for that? Why should we say, tell the truth? Or or not do abortion, or whatever the moral question is, whatever answer you've come up with. Um, if you think God has given you the answer, how did you get that? Did you talk to him? Did he come to you in a dream? Did you hear a voice? Most people would say, well, no, I don't hear voices. Okay, then where did you get it? Well, I got it from the book. <clears throat> Unfortunately, the creator of the universe has written many books, uh, and they're not always consistent across cultures of which is the right moral answer to these questions. So at some point, you have to do some reflecting, reflective thought. And how does that happen? And if you think God did it, did God actually have good reasons for these moral homilies, these moral principles? If there are good reasons, then why do we need God? Why not just invoke the reasons? The reasons are we shouldn't lie because that breaks trust in the social relationship, and you have to have trust in social relationships, <clears throat> excuse me, for them to work. And uh, why not that? Why is that not good enough? What, what point does it, does it bring to it to add something else when we can simply ask, well, where did God get those moral ideas? In my case, I was not raised religious, but uh, my peer groups in high school and college were religious, so I, I went down that path. I did go to Pepperdine University uh, in California. It didn't help, hurt, hurt that it was in Malibu, California, I have to admit. But nevertheless, I took it pretty seriously and uh, became a student of theology and took courses in the Old Testament, the New Testament, and the life of Jesus and the writings of C.S. Lewis and, and so on. And I, uh, I became an evangelical, which by definition means you are evangelizing. You go door to door. Uh, so Sort of an Amway with Bibles, and uh, but we did take that pretty seriously. And then later, when I became sort of a militant atheist, and and I went around to those same doors and knocked on the doors that yeah, I take it back, I was you know wrong. <laughs> and uh, which sort of reminds me, what you get when you cross an atheist with a Jehovah Witness is somebody who knocks on your door for no reason at all. <laughs> Now look, I can't possibly cover all of the arguments for and against God's existence in 20 minutes. To that extent, I feel a little bit like I have to take the posture of Henry VIII when he told his wives, I won't keep you long. <laughs> Basically, it boils down to this, that uh, there are a set of, of mysteries that uh, traditionally, we have been unable to explain that historically have always been explained uh, from a top-down supernatural uh, entity being of some kind that has always usually been called God or gods. And in the last 10,000 years, there's been roughly about 10,000 gods. So I presume most of you, like, like me, are atheists when it comes to Zeus and Thor and Ganesha and all the other thousands of gods that people have traditionally believed. Uh, and, and to that extent, you already know where I'm coming from because you know that there's no evidence for those gods. They're socially constructed. They were part of the culture. People really did believe them then. They don't believe them now. We do recognize, all of us in the room, how that works. I'm just saying, it's okay to go one God farther. 
it's the same principle at work in the culture you happen to have been born in, uh, how you were raised, the particular sets of arguments that are used after you already make that, that belief commitment and, and so forth. Um, nevertheless, of course, those arguments are still uh, made after the fact. Uh, let me clarify one thing, atheist, non-theist, agnostic, bright, whatever. The labels are, are problematic because uh, it assumes that you already know what I'm talking about when I talk about this particular word. Uh, atheism is just a lack of belief in a God. It isn't a thing to be, it isn't a position to take, it's not like a political position where we have seven planks that we adhere to. It's just, I just don't believe in God. That's that's it. So in the Q&A, don't ask me, do you have faith in atheism or isn't atheism a religion? No, it isn't anything. It's just, it's not a, it's just a starting point. No, I don't believe now. Let's talk about what we do believe. Uh, and if you want, in the Q&A, we can go about other things that we do believe, human rights or civil liberties or whatever. But that's not religion. That's politics. And if we want to talk about a particular religion, did Jesus rise from the dead? Was he resurrected? And so on. That's irrelevant to the question at hand tonight. Is there a God? Uh, there may be a God in, in the Christian God is not the right God. There may be some other God, or maybe the Christian religion is the wrong one, but it's the right God. There's all those possibilities. That's also irrelevant. We just want to know, is there a creator of some kind? The arguments used uh, boil down to really two, two general things that uh, Immanuel Kant identified in the uh, 18th century. That is, the starry heavens above and the moral law within. That's really what it boils down to. How do you guys, scientists, non-theists, secularists, whatever, explain the starry heavens above and the moral law within? In, in modern jargon, it's something like, where'd the universe come from? Uh, well, the Big Bang. Yeah, okay, but what banged the Big Bang? How did that get started? What was there before the Big Bang and so on? Or how is it that the configuration of the laws of nature are in such a way that here we are? That is, atoms are structured in a certain way that give rise to molecules and biochemistry and, and life and so forth. Here we are. Um, and then where does morality come from? Why would anybody, why would anybody be good without God? Um, and, uh, and then how does God act in, in the world? That is, it appears maybe there's miracles or unexplained mysteries that scientists can't explain. And that's how God works in, in, the, uh, in the world. So let's go through these real quickly. Um, the problem with saying, well, there has to be a cause to the universe that does not need a cause... Why can't there be, and that, and that therefore is God, that's an ancient argument, but why, why does there have to be some sort of entity that causes the universe? Why can't it be a non-entity? Maybe there's some other universe that causes universes. And of course the theist would say, yeah, but those universes had to be created by some non-universe type creator. And, and that gets us into an infinite regress and that can go nowhere. That, those are the kinds of philosophical questions I think that are best resolved over adult beverages late at night. <laughs> because ultimately I think our brains are too restricted, too limited in our capacity to solve those kinds of problems. So to me, a scientist, it doesn't offer anything to say God did it. Why not just say Zeus did it? It's a non-answer. That is, as soon as you step out of the realm of the natural and say, well, I think a supernatural entity did it, the word supernatural, it's just a word. It's just a linguistic placeholder for, I don't know, or I can't explain it, or it's an unsolved mystery. We'll say it was a supernatural event. Uh, to use a slightly different subject, less controversial for tonight, the paranormal. It's another subject that we deal with at Skeptic Magazine, skeptic.com, the paranormal, ESP, psychic power, I'm reading your minds and so on. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and so let's say that it turns out, I, I don't believe that by the way, but let's say it turned out that people really can read each other's minds. And let's say that we figured out a mechanism for it, explaining the paranormal. It turned out it's some quantum mechanic thing. It's like inside neurons, the little subatomic particles in the atoms inside our neurons collapse, and the wave function collapses across neurons in a sort of harmonious way. And there's this spooky action at a distance that we know does happen in quantum mechanics experiments, and somehow it leaves my skull and influences the neurons in your skull and I can read your thoughts and you can read my thoughts. And now we know what the mechanism is. Let's say that turns out to be true. That's an actual theory, by the way. I'm not just making that up. Some stuff I just make up, but that one, it's actual real. Um, that would no longer be the paranormal. Right? It would just be physics, psychophysics or something. It would be a branch of psychology, a branch of neuroscience, a branch of quantum mechanics or physics or something like that. 
So the word paranormal is just a linguistic placeholder, much like when cosmologists and astronomers talk about dark energy and dark matter. They don't mean that as an explanation. It isn't an explanation. It isn't an answer at all. It's a linguistic placeholder that says, we're not sure what's causing the galaxies to hold together the way that they do. There's not enough stuff that we can see and measure at the moment to explain it. Therefore, there's something else. We'll just call it dark energy for now. The problem I have with theism is that that would be the answer for the theist. Oh, it's a dark energy, or God did it, or something like that. As if that's an answer. It's not an answer. It's a non-answer. It's a, it's a showstopper. It's a conversation stopper. If you're doing science and reason and logic and so on, we have to keep pushing further and deeper. What, what caused that? Um, so that's the problem with offering something like a supernatural explanation. How do we explain the origins of the universe? God did it. That's not an answer. It, it doesn't answer anything. You know, don't you want to know how she did it? <laughs> that alone tells us something about the cultural, psychological constraints on our thoughts about a deity. As for the fine-tunedness of the universe, well, look, um, it is pretty amazing how all the laws of nature are configured in such a way to give rise to atoms and molecules and inorganic chemistry and organic chemistry and self-replicating double helix DNA and so forth. But I think it's a little early in the history of science, only four centuries old, to say we now know enough about everything to say it can't possibly be explained by natural forces, therefore there has to be a supernatural force, even leaving aside my first argument that there, can't, there is no such thing as a supernatural force. That's a non-answer. But even leaving that aside for a second and just say we can't explain it, how do you know? Before you say something is out of this world, let's first make sure that it's not in this world. And there's so much we still don't know about this world world, by which I mean us, the universe, everything. So I think humility, modesty in the face of the great unknown is proper in this regard. We do have some explanations, by the way. Um, there may be multiple bubble universes. The history of, the history of science shows us that, in fact, uh, our perspective of the world gets constantly larger. We used to think we were at the center and the solar system was the entire uh, universe and just outside of the furthest planet were the, the starry heavens, the dome of heavens, and just outside of that were the angels and then God. And, uh, and since then, over the last four centuries, the universe has gotten steadily uh, larger. It has expanded. Physically, yes, it is expanding, but our thoughts about it have, have also expanded. So the idea that we're the only bubble universe, of course, is still restricting. How do you know we're the only expanding bubble universe? There might be multiple universes. And there is some reason to believe it's possible that uh, whenever a star collapses into a black hole, a collapsing black hole itself creates a new bubble universe. This is one theory for the origins of universes. Why not ask that question and try to answer it scientifically? That is one answer. Um, and so and to that extent, any universe that would have laws of nature configured in such a way to give rise to atoms, would therefore have stars, would therefore have stars that collapse into black holes and create new universes, new baby universes, so they would be more likely to survive and create more universes that have those particular laws of nature. This is sort of a Darwinian selection process of universes. Those universes that have laws of nature that don't give rise to atoms don't create stars to collapse into black holes. They give rise to no more universes and they're selected against and they disappear. Now, that's still largely theoretical. There's some decent reasons to believe it might be true, but nevertheless, that's how a scientist thinks about these things. There's this theory, there's this hypothesis. We have to collect more data and test, we'll see. But that is one explanation for the fine-tunedness. And always in science, it's just okay to say, I don't know, and leave it at that. It's okay to have a tolerance for ambiguity and live with it. That's what we do in science. Third, the moral law, starry heavens above the moral law within. Why should we be good? Uh, where does the, the sense of morality come from? Uh, well, I wrote a book about this, Science of Good and Evil, on the fact that we're a social primate species in which we have to get along with one another. We have to have some means of conflict resolution, some social forces and pressures that lead us to want to be pro-social, cooperative, altruistic, nice. And we are most of the time with most of our fellow in-group members. As you know, though, by watching the news on any given day or studying any period of history, we're also pretty dang tribal. 
And uh, so it appears that we evolved through these Darwinian mechanisms, good evidence for this now because you can see it in primates, a propensity to be pro-social and cooperative and moral within groups and fairly xenophobic, competitive, bellicose and untrusting between groups. So we have within group morality, between group immorality, competitiveness. Uh, this is why I think, by the way, Old Testament law has much to say about that sort of thing. Love thy neighbor mostly means your fellow within group uh, members, which is why you can read these nice moral homilies on one page and turn the page and it tells you to rape, pillage, and destroy those creeps on the other side of the river because, you know, they, they believed in the wrong God. <laughs> So at least the New Testament's an improvement on that, but we can, we can do better still, I think, which we have over the last 500 years of extending civil liberties to more people in more places, uh, often in spite of religion, sometimes with the help of religion, sometimes in spite of religion. Um, and so that's where I think morality came from. We can test this in people. You see it. People naturally have uh, a sense of right and wrong. Uh, and, and so too, does it appear that chimpanzees and even small like capuchin monkeys with tiny little brains, the last common ancestor with them maybe 15 million years ago, uh, we, we do have social primates and all social mammals have some sense of, of a moral right and wrong. And of course culture tweaks it and, and so forth. Finally, this idea of God acting in the universe, acting in the world, miracles. Um, well, a miracle by definition is suspension of natural law. So to one extent, us scientists have nothing to say about it because we study natural law. And, uh, and by definition, a one-off event uh, that could never possibly happen again unless a supernatural entity entered into our natural world and stirred up the particles somehow, cured somebody's cancer or something like this, um, cannot be on our realm unless you the believer in miracles can tell us exactly what happened so we can study it, analyze it somehow. So there are studies on this, like for example, do people that are prayed for get better faster than those who are not prayed for? Well, this has been a, a subject of deep study for the last 20 years. The evidence is overwhelmingly clear, no. Prayed for people don't do any better than non-prayed for people. And of course, people knew this in the 19th century when uh, Charles Darwin's uh, uh, cousin uh, Galton uh, did a study on uh, the longevity of prayed for people versus non prayed for people. The royal family got prayed for more than anybody in the entire country, and they didn't live as long even as commoners. So apparently, it didn't work then. And the definitive study done uh, and published last year, funded by the Templeton Foundation, a pro Christian organization, showed conclusively that 1,800 heart patients prayed for group, non-prayed for group, control group, and so on. Uh, the prayed for group, not only did they not get better faster or anything like that, they did even slightly worse than the, than the non-prayed for group. The only explanation for, for this was when they found out that they were being prayed for by professional prayers, they thought, uh-oh, <laughs> whoo, I must really be sick. And uh, maybe that had a sort of a, a nocebo effect on them. Um, <laughs> And why is it that miracles uh, always seem to be uh, surrounding things that might have happened anyway, statistically speaking, I mean? Uh, first of all, you have the sort of bizarre kind of attribution of miracles like, boy, I was about to board the plane and something happened and I didn't, and the plane went down and, you know, and I would say, God really was looking after me. Yeah, but what about the guy that got on the plane instead of you? Uh, what, God didn't like him? Doesn't he have a family, people that love him, and now they're suffering instead of your family? What kind of a God would do that? Uh, or uh, something like uh, in 9-11, in you see these stories, I turned left instead of right, and I, you know, I was saved. What about the people that turned right instead of left? God didn't like them? I mean, what does that say about a deity? Is that a kind of God you'd like to believe in that would make those kinds of decisions for us? And, and I know many of you have probably heard this, and I know John has heard this, but it's not a frivolous argument. What is God a God against amputees? I mean, since the Iraq war began, we have in America just hundreds, if not thousands, of amputees. They've lost limbs. Most of them are Christians. Almost everybody in America is a Christian, right? So these are Christians praying to get better. They have Christian family members who love them deeply, praying for them to get better. Not one of them has grown a new limb. Meanwhile, God is busy causing tumors to go into remission, which, by the way, they just happen to do that on their own anyway. 
How convenient it is that the miracles always happen to be things that might have happened anyway, and then you back into it by attributing it to the particular God you happen to believe in. Uh, the amputee thing is actually pretty serious, and I'll finish with this. Um, and when I was in Perth a couple of days ago, I met a, a neuroscientist working on the regeneration of nerves, spinal cord nerves to help paralyzed people. And I was encouraged to learn that we're actually making some pretty serious progress here by studying, say, um, amphibians that do grow and reptiles that do grow new limbs. Well, first of all, if an amphibian could do it, couldn't an all-powerful God do it? help these poor soldiers that fought for their Christian country and grow those new limbs? Apparently not. And if a salamander can do it, could we do it? It appears, yeah, we will be able to do this. Probably if it's not five or ten years, maybe it's 50 to 100 years. Whatever it is, we're going to do it. And in fact, this leads me to my final uh, comments. If you go in search of a, uh, an extraterrestrial, if you go in search of some sort of entity, a being of, of near infinite power, uh, or even infinite power, um, what would you call a kind of an, an extraterrestrial intelligence that we might encounter who is actually able to do genetic engineering and create self-replicating molecules, simple cells, complex cells, multicellular organisms? Look how close we are to solving a lot of these medical issues with stem cells, genetic engineering, now apparently regeneration of nerves. Just in 50 years of research, look how much we've been able to do. What might we be able to do in, say, 500 years or 5,000 years? What would you call an entity that could do that? Uh, well, if you don't know the technology, you'd say, well, that's God. But if you know the technology, then it isn't God. And that's the problem of using any kind of science or reason or logic to try to reason your way to God, is you could, you'll never find a deity. You can only find a super powerful, intelligent being like us, but just slightly more. And so with that, I don't see that there's any reason uh, to believe in God. Thank you.